Aloha. Welcome to Condo Insider. Again, filming from a remote location because of COVID-19. Hope all of you are safe and well at home and that they relax restrictions and allow us to enjoy our wonderful Hawaii again. My name is Richard Emery. I'm your host today on Condo Insider. Condo Insider is a show about condominium living in Hawaii, primarily for board members as well as owners. They understand our industry better. And uh, we've done about 175 shows, and uh, you can go on YouTube and Think Tech Hawaii and do a search by category or type and hopefully learn lots of interesting, relevant information. As I said in a previous show, we're beside our interviews and one-on-one interviews with people, we're testing the concept of um, a more direct educational series. We talk about a topic, and uh, so I'm not only the guest, I'm the host, and all in one package. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. This is our second effort at this. And uh, today's topic is fiduciary duty. What is the board's meaning of a fiduciary duty? And I, Frank, I have to tell you, I've been doing this 25 years, and uh, I think there's more misunderstanding about fiduciary duty and what it really means, and the way it's applied by many people isn't correct. But we're going to kind of go through this a little bit and talk about it, but I also used to joke many years ago that when a new director gets elected to the board, kind of the drum rolls and the music sounds, and out of the ground comes a halo, and, and all of a sudden... Uh, it goes above their head, and they're saying, I'm now a fiduciary. And they think it means something different than it really is. So I want to kind of go through that today because, as you'll find out in this little topic seminar, uh, you expose yourself, if not properly applied, to personal liability. And your direct and offshore liability insurance may not cover you uh, with regard to your act as a director. So let's look at what slide one says, and that is, what is a fiduciary? What is the definition? If a person who owns another, in this case a condo association, the duties of good faith, trust, and confidence and candor. So you got to be honest. you got to be acting in good faith, and you, you have to do it in a trustworthy way. And part two is you have to exercise a high standard of care um, in managing another's money or property. So as a fiduciary, you have a, a, a big role, but what you have to understand, the most common misunderstanding is you're a fiduciary as a part of a board of directors. You individually have no independent individual authority to do anything. You get to vote and you get to participate in board meetings and other owner-type meetings. And you get to express yourself, but all of your decisions and all of your actions should be in the best interest of the association, not necessarily what you personally like, maybe not necessarily what you'd like to do, but really what's in the very best interest of the association. Now, slide two basically says, when you make these decisions and you vote in a board meeting, you owe the association of fiduciary duty in the form of the director's duties, and that duty is to the association itself. It's not to yourself. It's not to the owners. It's not to anybody but the association. So you've got to be careful that uh, when you go to a meeting, for example, and you have a vote. That's, I always use this bad example, but you want to paint the building pink and you have a five-member board, and four of you vote yes to paint the building pink. You don't like pink, and you want the building blue, and you vote no. I don't want to paint the building pink, and you vote no, and the motion gets passed because it's four to one. You can't go out and start writing letters to owners and say, I'm on the board, and the board did a crappy job. They should have picked blue because it lasts longer than pink. You have an obligation to the association, and the association, through its governance and through its bylaws, has made a decision lawfully and correctly with the board majority, you don't have the right to go out and criticize the board and say bad things about them and say, I 
they're all wrong and I'm right because you're part of a fiduciary interest. If the association has in good faith passed a lawful resolution, you have an obligation to support it, to support it till its conclusion, to help that successful resolution be implemented. And you can't create all of this humbug and drama with respect to the fact you didn't get your way because that's your personal interest. And the bylaws of the association establish governance and they establish the rules as well as condominium state law. And so you have a fiduciary obligation to support the majority decisions of the board of directors. That doesn't mean you can't express yourself and your reservations and your concerns. You can't go out and you can't try to, quote, sabotage the decisions the board has lawfully made because of the fiduciary your obligations to the association, and the association has, through its lawful governance procedures and the bylaws, as supported by state law, made a decision, and you have an obligation to support that decision. So, looking at slide three, you must always place the interest of the association above your own interest at all times. You know, New Zealand board meetings can debate and argue. Uh, hopefully, you don't make it personal. And, you, and at the end of the day, it's got to be the best interest of your association. I had an example recently where uh, a board was uh, a three-member board, and, um, and two of the board members were delinquent in their maintenance fees. And the third board member uh, liked those two people. And so she basically... I was saying, well, I think it's okay. We don't have to. Uh, we can wait longer before we um, enforce the requirements to pay the maintenance fees and get a lien and do whatever is necessary, payment plan, whatever it may be. Now, is that doing the best interest of the, uh, of the association? Are you doing the right thing for the association by not protecting the financial interests of the association by collecting against the delinquent owner? What if you wait and wait and wait and that owner all of a sudden falls bankruptcy and you lose your ability to collect it? You have to put these personal friendships and judgments aside and say, I have an obligation to the association. They have a zero-sum budget. They need to have everybody pay their maintenance fees like everybody else. And so I'm sorry, you two have a conflict of interest. We're going to have to refer to our established board collection policy and let our attorney deal with this matter because that's protecting the association's interest. And it's a tough thing to do when you know people are hurting. And, uh, this COVID-19, I don't think people know exactly how many maintenance fees and delinquencies there are going to be. And certainly uh, the statute provides for uh, uh, payment plans and things along that line. So uh, uh, there are ways to deal with it. But just to stick your head in the sand and ignore it is not the right answer. Now, what I hear all the time also is, well, it's the management company's responsibility. Well, let's take a look at slide four real quick, the managing agent. We understand that role. The managing agent, except in limited circumstances, must implement the policies of the board of directors. The managing agent does not have any independent authority to manage the property. The responsibility for managing the property is the board of directors and solely the board of directors. And they have to take all the actions necessary. And the managing agent has to do what the board says. However, the managing agent who doesn't like what the board says can certainly say, well, I'm giving you notice I'm going to cancel my contract because of the fact that um, I believe my duty and my license, you're putting me in jeopardy. A good example would be another association I was recently involved with uh, the board, they have a provision in their bylaws say they must retain a managing agent. Now, under the statute, a managing agent has a licensed real estate broker with a bond and certain other requirements, and they're registered with the Real Estate Commission, and they're a managing agent. Well, the board then, the board majority said, well, I think we better be better self-managed. I think it might be cheaper. I don't like their management company's contract. I think we're just going to go ahead and be self-managed. But the bylaws say you have to have a managing agent. It doesn't say may have a managing agent. It says shall have a managing agent. So does the board have the authority 
to say, well, let's go self-manage. No, they don't. They've got to ask the owners if they want to amend the bylaws and provide for self-management. And so if they go out, which they did in this case, and say, we're just not going to have a management company. I'm going to get a local bookkeeper. I'm going to put that local bookkeeper on the checking account. And they don't have a bond. But I, uh, we think we're better off we can control it, recognizing those people may not be elected next year or may get run over by a bus and you may not have the continuity a couple of years from now you have on day one. But did the board breach its fiduciary duty? Yes. They have an obligation to follow the bylaws. If the bylaws say you shall have a managing agent, you have to have a managing agent. A managing agent is a legal term in the statute, and that means a real estate broker with a bond has met other criteria. If you don't do that, you're not doing your job, and you've breached your fiduciary duty. But they've got to stop boards. They've got to stop saying that's the management company's responsibility, because it's not. The management company is, is the agent, that's the key word, the agent for the board of directors, and has the responsibility to follow the board's instructions, or if they don't want to do it, they can resign. And so if the, if the, if, if the board just has to recognize that it cannot change that, Looking at slide five, board members can also be held liable for the actions of agents and employees of the association if those agents or employees fail to carry out the board and their own fiduciary duties. What is meant by that? So boards say, well, I'm going to delegate that to a committee. Well, they can certainly assign the responsibility to a committee, but they can't take away the ultimate responsibility of that of the board of directors. Another example would be another association I was involved in recently, that essentially uh, the owner wanted to do some remodeling within their apartment, and of course that affects some of the shared utilities and things along that line. And they uh, submitted a request to the board. Uh, they had an architect and engineer, they had a building permit, and they wanted to make these internal changes to the uh, their apartment. The board said, well, we have a committee to deal with that. And the committee wouldn't approve it. They wouldn't disapprove it either. They just refused to take action. They refused to take action for three years. So the owner couldn't use this apartment because they needed to make these changes. And so this resulted in a lawsuit. Can the board say, well, we gave it to the committee or we have a, a, a sub-association your governing documents, your bylaws are going to determine your responsibilities. And they're going to determine what you have to do. And you can't simply say, I'm going to delegate this responsibility to somebody. And therefore, I'm washing my hand. And if something goes wrong, it's not my fault. It is your fault. Because you as a board have ultimate responsibility for the bylaws and the governing documents and state law for that association and the ultimate outcome. Can you use committees? Certainly you can use committees. Can you uh, get advice from committees? Certainly you can get advice from the committees. But you can't absolve yourself from the responsibilities that are required of you as a fiduciary, as a member of the board of directors. And on that note, we're going to go through a break and come back with more of your potential risk if you don't exercise your fiduciary duty. We'll be right back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Krista Stadler, the host of Nonprofits Mean Business 2 on Think Tech Hawaii. Nonprofits Mean Business 2 investigates the operational challenges and costs related to managing nonprofit organizations. While encouraging our viewers to find a nonprofit organization that you're passionate about in our community, we are streamed live on Think Tech Hawaii bi weekly at 12 p.m. on Thursdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo. We're back. Back to 
Condo Insider talking about fiduciary duty, and I was talking to you about how important this is, that, that you as a board member don't have independent authority. You're a part of a board of directors. You're obligated to support those actions of the board of directors, and at the same time, you can't go out on your own and ignore this by saying, well, let's just put someone else responsible, but it's not our fault. And it will be, in the end, your fault. Briefly looking at the next slide, which is slide six to recap this, a director must not permit another duty or interest to prevent them from making an independent decision based on the best interests of the association. Let's take another example. The director gets elected by cumulative voting to an association. Because a small group that's got cumulative voting power uh, wants to get representation because they don't like the way the board is conducting this affairs or the, or the decisions they're making. Well, that's great, but now that's a person, the minority member of the board, and he can express, and he can advocate, he can fight for what he believes in. At the end of the day, if the board makes another decision, he has, he or she, has an obligation to support it. And so, in some of these times, it involves legal matters. So can that director go back to the people who got him on the board by cumulative voting and tell him privately what happened in an executive session? Absolutely not. They breached their fiduciary duty to their obligation, which is the association. And believe me, I've seen it before that people get so excited about what they believe their just cause is that they breach their duty by sharing confidential information with the board outside of a board meeting to people who don't have the legal right and to that information. And that's going to put them in a situation uh, to do that. So um, uh, let's look at what goes on to the next slide, which is conflict of interest. Under the statute, if a director has a conflict of interest, clearly he cannot vote. In the statute, you can't vote and you must disclose, and it must be recorded in the minutes, that you have a, a conflict of interest. And that has an important part of protecting yourself should something go wrong down the road. What I saw recently, which just seems pretty benign, is that a board of five uh, needed to replace the roof. They went out and got bids. And all the bids were, I'll use an example, $50,000. One director says, you know, I live here, it's going to cause an assessment. I will, I'm a licensed roofing contractor. I will do it through my cost, and I'll do it for $30,000. So look at the situation. You have a licensed roofing contractor who's prepared to do the roof for $30,000, save the association twenty grand, save everybody money. Can the board approve that? Yes, they can approve that. The key is that the director who's the licensed roofing contractor has got to say, I've made a bid, and assuming the bids are all apples to apples, and my price is 30000 and I'm disclosing I'm the owner of the roofing company that made that bid, and I'm not going to vote. If the other four vote, three to one, four to zero, and approve the contract with the owner roofing contractor, everybody has saved money and nothing is wrong. The key is that director had an obligation to disclose a conflict of interest, put it in the minutes, and then the balance of the board members can um, decide whether they want to make the, the roof happen in this case. Question, does that mean, what if the board members, the other board members in a separate situation say, I think you have a conflict of interest, and therefore you can't vote on that? Well, the reality of it is, the person who decides to have a contract is the individual himself. The board can't vote four to zero and say, we're not going to let you vote on a topic because we think you have a conflict of interest. It's up to the individual, that director, to say, I have a conflict of interest. Most common time it comes up, which is kind of idiotic in my book, is when the directors vote proxies for at an annual meeting for the directors or to elect. And they say, oh, you have a conflict of interest. You're voting for yourself. Well, I'm sure every political candidate in the history of the world has always voted themselves in an election. And yes, the board can say, in our best interest, we think these people should be candidates, and they can vote the proxy. 
That's not a conflict of interest. But the reality of it is, it's back to the individual who's the one who's going to determine whether it's a conflict of interest. One of the famous lawsuits here in, in Hawaii on this, uh, goes back a couple of years, was an uh, owner board president in a timeshare association. Uh, they needed to replace all the furniture. And the bid for the low bid for the furniture uh, was like $3 million. And he didn't disclose he was the owner of the furniture company that made the furniture. And so they bought the $3 million in the furniture. And then all the furniture was crap and it fell apart. And the association sued him because of the fact he didn't disclose his conflict of interest. And he voted on a matter where he had a direct pecuniary interest. You know what? That individual lost and had to pay back the $3 million to the association. So don't think you don't have any liability on this matter. Because what's interesting in that type of a case, the director and officer of liability insurance we all buy won't cover you for willful intent and gross negligence. And when you violate the statute, that's gross negligence. And if you willfully didn't tell anybody what's going on, that's willful intent. So it can be a very expensive lesson for directors if they don't know what to do. Next slide, please. That's why this kind of review, the director or officer may be personally liable for damage, injury, or loss covered by the result of his or gross, or gross negligence and performance or breach of fiduciary duties. Personal liability means you as a director, officer, or association may be excluded from coverage of the DNO insurance and may need to pay the defense costs and judgment out of your own pocket. So you got to take this very seriously, even though you may not like um, all the things that are uh, going on. Let me see where we are. That's the last slide. So we're going to talk about some more examples of what this means with regard to uh, uh, some examples of people who have breached their fiduciary duty. I give you one example. You don't follow the bylaws. you got to follow the bylaws of state law. Not protecting the association's financial interests. Not collecting delinquencies. Uh, because you have a personal interest or know someone or don't feel it should be done. Now, I want to reward, uh, take one little moment to, I'm a licensed real estate broker, and give a little special warning to real estate agents who serve on condominium boards of directors. You know, we as real estate agents have that obligation, A, under state law, but we have to maintain a uh, honest, Opinion in the in the marketplace, kind of we have to be noted for being uh, honest and fair dealing uh, as businessmen. And then the Hawaii Association of Realtors, the Hawaii Realtor Ethics, requires the same thing. We maintain a, a, a professional position of honest and fair dealing. So if you're a realtor on a board and you breach your fiduciary duty, you may be jeopardizing your license by having a RICO complaint. You may be jeopardizing your relationship with the uh, uh, Realtor Association because you breach your duty of honesty and fair dealing. You see all the time when the real estate industry, uh, RICO, they find you for having a, a DUI. You think if you intentionally and willfully breached your governing document to cause harm to the association, that you wouldn't be considered a person who's, whose reputation isn't the best and you might get a fine from the RICO. You can lose your license in some of the cases I've seen where you have intentionally um, ignored your fiduciary duties and caused harm to the association itself. You've breached your fiduciary role. So as a real estate agent, I would just tell you, you have to even be more cautious on these matters. One of the big common things that creates a lot of this problem and how you can uh, rely on what I'm going to call the safe haven is get professional advice. You have someone saying you can go self-manage, and the bylaws say no, but they're saying, well, shell means may. You don't need no opinion from a lawyer. Go talk to an independent professional. That's, that's what you're measured on is listening to professionals and following professional advice. In this case, and the one I gave you earlier about self-manage, the professional said, no, you can't go self-manage. You can't do that. And the lawyer even quit because they went ahead and went ahead and tried to do uh, – self-management without uh, uh, any professional advice to support it. 
And so if you're a real estate agent on that board and you went along with it, believe me, you've exposed yourself to liability if someone independently makes a complaint because it ultimately some harm may be done. And whenever you take actions, make sure it's always done at a board rate. I had another association recently um, that basically, uh, it's a 2 2 board. One person quit. The two were like the Republicans and the Democrats in Congress. They couldn't agree on who to replace as, appoint as the fifth rector. Well, you can go to court and get the judge to do it, but that's not a good idea. So, the two directors, one side said, Well, you know, I don't think you're an owner. You're the trustee of a trust, but I don't think you're an owner. So, we're going to go ahead and change the president. And we're going to go ahead and write all these letters to the owner saying we have a new president. And we're going to change all the rules uh, and, and do a lot of changes. So let me see if I understand that. A 2-2 board, without any professional legal advice, all of a sudden absconded with the association and tried to take adverse action. What they didn't think about is the stack. In these types of situations, the president has broad authority under the bylaws. And he went and hired a lawyer anyway and, and put them on notice of holding them legally responsible for all the extra costs of taking that action. So, you know, this is not something to um, look uh, and avoid and ignore. And the final thing which really going to hurt you is what I call retaliation. If all of a sudden, like in Molokai, they went and they hired a guy to beat up one of the owners who was causing the board all sorts of problems, and that cost them a million dollars. You know, so you've got to look at this fiduciary thing very clearly as an important role. You've got to be independent. Your loyalty is to the association as a whole, not to your own beliefs and your own standards as to what the board majority votes and what your governing documents, bylaws, and state laws set. And on that note, I'm going to thank you for watching Condo Insider. I hope you learned something today. We ran out of time, so I can't give you my 500 question test. And I wish to see you in a Condo Insider next week for another exciting episode of Condo Insider. Aloha.